Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in a neighborhood, love to meet you. You can join us here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in the book of Colossians, and we will be in chapter 1. So grab your Bibles, uh, pencil, highlighter, and so forth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for... Just a beautiful day, and as you end this week, Lord, with all of its trials and worries and cares, its blessings <coughs> and your guidance and wisdom that you have just given to us, Lord, I pray that we begin a new week, Lord. Uh, Father, as we begin uh, this coming Sunday, Father, as we worship you in your temple, Father, with believers in Christ Jesus as you, as, as you have commanded us to, Lord that you would minister to us and instruct us for the week, Lord, as we're going through the Bible and teaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, within its own context, Father. We pray that you would give us instruction for the week, Lord. And Lord, that we would hear your voice very clearly, Father, and know that our relationship with you is one that is intimate and one that is blessed, Lord. But here we are this morning, Lord. We just ask for wisdom for today. We ask that you lead us and guide us, Father, through your word, as the Apostle Paul uh, writes to the Colossians. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Good morning, Diana. Glad you could join us and anyone else that's watching. So again, we're in Colossians chapter 1, so you might want to turn your Bible there. Uh, let me just give you a few little notes here. Uh, Colossians was pretty close to Ephesians in geographical area. Um, Paul the Apostle was not the founder of the Colossian church. It was one of his uh, subjects or friends in the gospel laborers together. Was, Paul was writing from prison uh, there in Rome, 60 to 61 AD. And his theme here seems to be the supremacy of Christ trying to help the Colossians see that there's no one with more authority than Christ himself, that he is above all different philosophies and thoughts in life, <clears throat> and that he is the source of all things and the source of all wisdom, the source of life itself. And so he makes that very clear uh, in this uh, little book that he writes there to Colossians. The preeminence or the person that is above all things <clears throat> is Jesus Christ. Uh, there are some verses here that are a little controversial that you can use uh, dealing with cults. We're not going to necessarily um, look at those in depth at all, but we're just going to just hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. So let's go ahead and, and open up our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> now, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So his typical way of beginning, as you know, as we've been going through the Bible, he always starts with that truth. Uh, sometimes he'll add that it was by the will of God. It's not of man that he was called. He'll add who he's with, and in this case, he's with Timothy, uh, not just his son in the faith, but also a brother in the Lord. And he says that he's writing to the saints, that is all of the Christian believers there in Colossae, and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's like uh, blessing somebody. So I, I'm praying, Paul is saying, that God would just bless you, bring you grace and peace. Now there is an order to that, and you'll find it in his epistles. He usually says grace, and then he says peace. Because you can't experience true peace. And when I say true peace, peace, I'm talking about the peace of God. Not the peace that you find maybe in materialism or in relationships or other things. But the peace that you have in God only comes by grace. And grace means favor. It's the favor of God that, give, that he gives to us. And it's given to us by faith. So we have to have faith in God that he's going to give us favor because that's who he is. He's a God of favor. He's a God of blessings. And he gives us those things not because we're good, not because we're special, but just because he's God. And so we would really want to come to God and ask for grace, 
not on the basis of our merit, but just because he's a good God. And that's always the best way to come to God in humility. Then he goes on, we give thanks to God the Father and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Um, so obviously the gospel is spreading, right? What Jesus asked the disciples to do in, in Acts chapter 1 was to go wait for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon them, then they were to go out and minister the gospel as martyrs or witnesses. Uh, first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the world. And here Paul is saying the, that the gospel has gone out to the world and it's making an impact. Uh, is the gospel making an impact today? It doesn't seem like it as you look at the churches diminishing, as you look at the world's uh, view increasing, uh, evil increasing, uh, hatred increasing. Uh, it seems like the gospel message isn't something that... Um, is inviting anymore i believe and, and there's all uh, kinds of different possibilities but i personally believe that the reason that the message of the gospel is not received anymore by this generation is because they've seen a, a generation within the church of hypocrisy they they don't they no longer believe that the bible is powerful enough to really mm. truly change someone because because they'll because the church isn't living out what they believe when you, when you look at it statistically, there was a statistic that said that, that uh, a certain, and it was a high percent of church-going believers that didn't believe that the Bible was relevant for today. When, when you believe that, then really there's no power in living it. What you're doing is you're coming for a motivational message, something to lift your spirit up, something to encourage you, something to give you hope, and it's all about me, 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 me. And it's not about teaching us to serve one another, love one another tolerate one another and so the world sees this that you guys can't even get along yourself that's why you have all these different denominations and all of these different groups of people uh and, and so and you want us to join the church and i think they're seeing that and, and so they're they're um they're not in they're not in a sense they're not feeling that they should be a part of a church that's weak and so unfortunately i think that that's one of the major reasons and there's other reasons uh, some might say it's the live streaming there are believers, true believers. There's always a remnant of believers that are uh, sincere and faithful to the Lord. There's always those. You know, the question is, is that we should be those. All of us should be that, and we should be living it wherever we're at. Amen. So he's saying the gospel is spreading, and boy, it's spreading like wildfire. Verse seven, as you also learned from uh, Apaphras, Epaphras, Epa. Epaphras. Those are hard words to pronounce. I actually write them out. It's an epaphis. Epaphis. Uh, he is actually the one that ministered to the Colossians and led them to the Lord and started a ministry there. He says, Our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So, so far, he's been really, you know, just kind of lifting them up right? Blessing them and encourage them, telling them what he's heard about them and the great work that God's doing in them. So he's the one that, that after I says, he's the one that's been telling us about your love in the spirit. For uh, uh, Verse nine, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled, and that means completely filled with the knowledge of, um, of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
Uh, that's a lot of blessings and a lot of hope that Paul has put into them that they would measure themselves uh, to that standard of walking right before the Lord. And I think that that's when you'll see the power of God uh, working in the church, when you begin to apply some of these things that Paul talks about. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us or transferred us into the kingdom of his son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And that's the gospel message. So he's reminding them that you have been saved and you have been saved for something. You haven't just been saved to do nothing and to live your life the way that you've been living it. You've been saved to do something for the kingdom of God. You've been transferred from the world to the kingdom of God. And now that you're in the kingdom of God, get busy with the gospel and spread it to the world. That's what he's saying here, because you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now he's going to get into some teaching here. <coughs> um, <coughs> many have misunderstood this next verse. I don't have time to really get into it. I wish I did, but I'm just going to say that what the Jehovah Witnesses believe about this verse <coughs> is not enough evidence to show that Jesus was created. So let's look at this, this verse here. It says, he, that is Jesus, is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, that's where they get confused and they say, oh, look, Jesus was the firstborn over all creation. Okay, so in other words, he was born into this world, just like the rest of us was born into this world. He was born to be over the creation of the world. Now, if this was the only scripture you had in the Bible, you might have a case for that. Right? If we had no other scriptures, you might say, okay, he was the firstborn over creation. That means he was born into this world. You might have a case, but the only problem is when you read the whole Bible, you find out that he wasn't born as we are born. You read the whole story of the, of the miraculous conception of Christ, Christ coming into Mary, a virgin, laying his seed in there, and Jesus coming forth as God, as God and as man. So you, you see that and you go, oh, there's a contradiction there. No, there's no contradiction. Our interpretation of this verse is wrong or their interpretation of this verse is wrong, the Jehovah Witnesses. So what he is saying is that he has a preeminence over all creation because he is God, the creator of God. And he's gonna explain that in the context. Again, if you pull this one scripture out by itself, yeah, I could see your case. But if you look at the whole context, it doesn't make any sense for your case. So let's, let's keep going on in our reading. It says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So if you're born like anyone else, how could you have created before you were born? It makes no logical sense. So that tells me that Jesus somehow existed before all things existed. Amen. Okay, so that, that's, that's a great possibility there. So how did he exist? Well, let's keep going. <clears throat> Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. So what all things? Well, everything he created. Powers, principalities, all that. And they all consist in him. Someone was asking for a scripture last Sunday. Um, and this is the one that I probably should have went to. They said, how do we know Christ holds everything together? Because we're talking about the earthquake. And here, that's what he's saying. All things consist in him. He's the one that holds it all together. It's by his hand. How can you do that as a mere man? Or as a Jehovah Witnesses would say that Jesus is Michael the archangel, you know, which again is, is not correct. There's no scripture reference to that whatsoever. So here it shows that he, can, he has everything in his own hand. He, he is the creator of it all, and he allows it to exist by his strength, says more than just a creation. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things he may have the preeminence. And that's his point right here, that Christ would have the preeminence over everything that's going on. In other words, he would be first in everything. He would be first in in our lives, in all of our relationships, in the things that we do, he would be first. The perfect example of this would be Martha and Mary. Uh, Jesus goes and visits them, 
and he sits down and immediately Martha begins to get busy. And that was the culture of that time, right? The women were to take care of the home. They were to take care of the guests. They were to be hospitable. So Martha was doing what the law required. There were things that were written about women and how they needed to do these things. Um, as I said on Sunday, you know, the, the law said that a woman can't read the Torah, nor should she read the Torah. In fact, one rabbi went off to say that if a woman is caught reading the Torah or explaining the Torah, it'd be better to burn the Torah than to allow a woman to read it. You know, Jews would not even touch a woman. You know, they wouldn't even touch a woman out in public or recognize a woman out in public. And so Martha was doing what the culture said she should be doing, what the law, the Torah, and the Jewish people had come up with, with laws and so forth. But Mary immediately fell at Jesus' feet, started touching him, and sat there while Jesus taught her. She's doing exactly what Jesus wanted her to do, and that was to sit at his feet. So Mary put him above everything else, right? Forget the culture, forget the Torah, forget what the rabbis taught, forget what they say we should be doing as women. I'm gonna go sit at, sit at Jesus' feet. I'm putting him above all of that. And that's what she did. And Jesus said she chose the better thing of the two. So that's what preeminence means is that we as believers must put Christ above everything that's in our lives. He has to be the first because he's God. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all things, or that, I'm sorry, in him all the fullness should dwell. Now, what does that mean, the fullness should dwell? Well, let's go on. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So. All things are reconciled through himself, whether in heaven or on earth. Sounds like um, Christ has the authority that the Father has. And that everything that the Father is, so is Christ. So you have a picture of the Trinity there. You have the Father, who is the one with the plan. He is the one giving direction and so forth. And you have the Son, who's implementing that plan and doing everything that the Father asks him to do. And then you have the Holy Spirit getting that work done through the believers. And what Paul is saying here is that Jesus has the authority of the Father. So what Jesus is saying is exactly as the, what the Father would say, because Jesus would never contradict the Father, nor would he go against the Father. But he would only implement what the Father has asked to the very point. And so he has all authority, all power, just as the Father does. So he has the throne just as the Father does. Uh, so, the fullness dwells within Him. Verse 21, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and in irreproachable in His sight. Now, real quick, when Paul says alienated and enemies in your mind, he's talking about the psyche of the mind. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 6, that was the issue that caused the flooding of the world because the very thoughts in their minds were so corrupt that God said, I'm going to destroy man. As they were thinking, or as the Hebrew says, they were formulating evil thoughts before they even came up with a thought and acted upon it, they were already formulating it within their hearts and in their minds, those evil thoughts. <clears throat> I think we know what he's saying there, right? Because we've all kind of formulated things in our minds where something starts to fester in us, you know, and we start formulating little plans on how we're going to handle this and handle that or take care of this or take care of that. And some of that stuff is evil and wicked, and sometimes we'll even stop and say, why am I thinking that way? I shouldn't even be thinking that way. And that's what Paul is saying, is that at one time, uh, we were men and women who, who were alienated by those thoughts of God, yet God sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to take care of those wicked works by the blood on the cross just like the blood that was put on the doorposts there in Egypt. And so the death angel came and didn't 
uh, kill anyone in that household that was first born, but mm. passed over it. So because of Jesus' blood and the fact that we have appropriated it, that means grabbed a hold of it by faith, uh, he passes over us, the death angel, so he doesn't get us in the same sense. So if it, verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So that's the gospel in a nutshell right there. So that section there is really a section that we should try to memorize so that when we get an opportunity, we can share with people. You know, if you just go up to someone and say, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they're like, well, no, not really. What do you, you mean, what Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about the religious Jesus? No, I'm talking about this Jesus. The Jesus who said that at one time we were aliens against him, alienated against him. We had wicked thoughts in our minds, and yet he came. And that's the gospel message that you can share with them. And, and that will blow them away because they don't understand that. They really don't understand that. And you can give them those examples, just like the blood, because they know the story of Moses from the Ten Commandments in the movie. You know, the blood was on the doorpost and the death angel passed over. That's exactly what Jesus did with his blood for us. You know. uh, the mind and the wickedness in Genesis 6, we know why the flood came, because the world was so corrupt. There was only one family, Noah. And at that, it was probably just Noah himself that was righteous. In fact, that's what the Bible says, because Noah was righteous. It didn't say because Noah and his family was righteous. It said Noah was righteous above all. So he goes on, and we'll close here. Verse 24, um, Christ's preeminence. Um, he should be, guys, preeminence in the church. <sighs> Unfortunately, he's not. Um, we were just talking about it earlier, right? How churches are getting away from teaching the Bible. Mm. I was actually thinking about this this morning. I didn't read the text or anything, nor did we have the conversation. But this morning I was thinking as I was studying, I was looking at the Greek for the next uh, five verses that we're going to look at on Sunday. I was looking at the Greek, and for a second there I thought, this is boring. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is boring. And I thought, I need, I'm need. i not a... I'm not a motivational speaker. I don't have a lot of stories. Um, I, I'm not brilliant in the, the way I use words, you know? And then the Lord says, but you're teaching the word. And I'm like, yeah, I'm teaching what the word says and that's all I'm teaching. <laughs> and, yeah, and he says, and that's what's needed. I, I might be boring to some, but that's because they're looking for that excitement. As the Bible says, they're looking, they're, they have itchy ears and they're finding preachers that will itch their ears. They want to feel excited. They want to feel motivated. They want to feel as though they have a purpose, you know, to succeed in life and be whatever it is they want. But they don't want to serve. They don't want to think of others more highly than they think of themselves. They just want to think of themselves. So I thought about that. And then when we were talking about... Uh, this young man who's very well known in the Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, who has taught at uh, some of the Harvest Crusades and how his teaching is no longer scriptural, but it's more stories. He'll, he'll pick a theme, like let's just say on relationships, you know, how we communicate, and then he'll just tell stories and what psychiatrists say, uh, psychology says about communicating and you know and all of those things and he'll spend time doing that and he'll sit there in, on, the, on the pulpit with on the stage and he'll be playing cards with somebody while he's talking so it's no longer a scriptural biblical study it's just someone's opinion of relationships in fact that's what made me think about this too because in these the section that we're looking at this section is dealing with sexual relationships uh, that Paul is dealing with with the Corinthians and it's an area that we don't hear a whole lot about and yet I'm going to be talking about it and I'm like oh Lord should I be talking about this no one else talks about it no one else talks about it but there's yet a balance to it because Paul is saying look you're the body of the woman is not her body and the body of the man is not his body but the body of the woman is his and his is hers and the way that it's put in the Greek there's no doubt about that. That is, she is yours continually, and then the emphasis in the Greek is continually. I mean, that's just a fact. That's, that's the reality of it. 
And yet, in our culture today, it's the opposite, right? The woman's in charge of her own body. Don't tell her what to do. You know, don't, don't, you know, otherwise you're a male chauvinist pig, you know? And yet the Bible says, mutually, by the way, I'm saying, right? Just as the man is, is not in control, mastering over his own, and that's what the Greek says. He does not master over his own body, but he willingly gives it. And so, uh, and it's both on both sides, so I'm making that clear. I'm not just picking on one side. I'm making that very clear. But that's so far from our culture today, and it's, in, and it's uh, kind of gotten into the church, right? Because now we have this thing where we withhold because we're angry and mad. And that's not what he's saying to do. So anyway, I got off the subject. <clears throat> uh, that's why it's important to teach the Word. Because the church is doing a lot of cultural things and not biblical things. And, and it's very hard to cleanse those thoughts from our mind unless you really understand what it's saying in the Word. If you don't see it in the Word and it's not clear, then you just stick with what you've been taught culturally. So he goes on. I know I'm in big trouble. I get it. <laughs> um, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions, afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery of or the hidden truth, which is really not hidden, because we know it as believers, which has been hidden from all ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. That's, that's our only hope. It's not me in me, it's Christ in me. Amen. And us allowing him to live through us, which is our challenge. Him we preach, Paul said. Now, Paul is saying here, look, I've suffered a lot for your sake. And he goes, and I get it, and I'm going to suffer a lot. Um, I think ministers are, are, are ones that suffer a lot, just having that position. You know, CEOs suffer a lot. They get... Um, they get a lot of slack, right? When something goes wrong, and oftentimes they have to what retire, you know? They I'm um, early retirement because I really messed up over here, <laughs> you know? Because they get the blame for the whole company. Well, pastors get that too, uh, and then on top of that, everything else because you know they're expected. Uh, we want you to preach the word, but then we want you to tell more stories. But then we want you to be real. But then we want you to not be too clear, you know? And then we want you to be shorter in your message because it's too long. You know, and it's just all these, these demands that are upon you. And that's just a few, you know, and then I, we love you. And then we don't love you, you know, and then we, we like what's going on. And then I don't like what's going on. And, and then you're not making good decisions there. And, oh, you made great ones over here, but, you know, not there. And, you know, and it's just all of this. And it's just a lot. And that's what Paul is saying here. I, I get all that, but I have a responsibility to the gospel. And that takes a hard shell. I guess, lack of a better word, a very hard shout to somehow emotionally uh, tie all those things up and, and get them out of you so that you can continue to be faithful with the pure word. And then he, he gives them this pure word that he's preaching to them. And he's saying to them in verse 28, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Notice he said in his working or in his energy. It's in his energy, which works in me mightily. It, Christ in us, that's what we have to give into and allow him to work in us. So Christ should be the center of, of your life. He should be your everything above all other things. He should take the preeminence because he has all authority. He has the fullness of God himself because he is God in the flesh. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Uh, there's just so much there, Lord, and uh, I can't wait to get to that book as soon as we're done with Corinthians which will be years from now, it seems. But, mm -hmm. Lord, just to uh, dissect that in the Greek language, Lord, would be an amazing thing. And I know that I just barely 
barely taught the surface of it, Lord. May you just minister to us where we're at, Father. I know that you are the one through your spirit that ministers to us. And, and I know that there was a, a thought there, a message for every person that was listening. And it may be different from another person, but it's what you wanted them to hear this morning. And I pray they take that, Lord, and they're comforted and equipped for the work you have for them, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayers, um, please post them or private message me, and we will pray for you as we're gathered here this morning. And we're going to begin with some prayer. God bless you. Love you. Hope to see you on Sunday. Check us out on our website, calvarychapelinland.org.